Welcome to Vegan Food and Living Simply Vegan podcast with me, Holly Johnson, and my co host, Molly Pickering. Yep, it's the Holly and Molly show. Each week, we'll be ranting about vegan news, raving about new food launches, and responding to your questions on all things plant based. I also chat to vegan chefs, experts, and influencers about everything from fermented food and nutrition to weight loss, herbalism, and seaweed. Ilchester has just launched two new vegan cheeses in 316 Tesco stores nationwide. Ilchester Vegan Blue and Ilchester Vegan Melting Mature have launched as 200 gram standalone plant-based cheeses after they featured in the Ilchester Vegan Festive Selection last Christmas. The festive selection was described by the Vegan Society as the most talked about vegan cheese selection of 2020. The Ilchester Vegan Blue Cheese features unique blue spirulina veins to mimic the look of blue cheese and has the same creamy texture and sharp and salty taste of the dairy version. The Ilchester Vegan Melting Mature is the mature vegan cheddar cheese known for sharing the same meltability factor as dairy cheddar cheeses, something that vegans have often said lacks in other plant-based cheeses. Welcome to this week's episode, which is the last in the series, but we will be back on the 3rd of August for series four. So don't worry. Hi, Molly. How are you? Hello. I'm okay. Very sweaty, very warm, clammy, in case you needed to know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we needed to know your exact temperature right now. Kind of wonder whether it's climate change, don't you? Because we seem to have nonstop rain and then like literally a massive heat wave then non-stop rain. It's just caught me off guard. I think I love the heat so much. I love it. Obviously, I don't sound like I do, but it's been so cold the last however long. It seems like years. It's been so cold. And then this, I can't yeah. keep up. I can't keep yeah. up. And you've got um, all the floods going on in Germany. And it's I know, just like... yeah, I think it is that. And then I think in the back of my mind, I'm just like, mm, but I'm getting a tan, it's fine. But then, no. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not fine. We all need to go it's vegan right fine. now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> anyway, a few positive vegan news stories to touch on this week. Firstly, the government's national food strategy, which um, the results for part two came out this week. It recommends a 30% um, reduction in meat in our diets, which is great. Not far enough, of course, in in vegan eyes. However, <laughs> um, you know, this is a move in the right direction. Yeah. And also the Zoe COVID study with Tim Spector has concluded that those eating a plant-based diet are 40% less likely to get severe disease. So yeah, it's crazy. I think it talked about quality of diet as well so obviously Mm. if you're living on chips and vegan nuggets then you know that might not be the case for you however (laughs) have you started eating better because I think a lot of people have really thought about their health a lot more haven't they? yeah definitely I think last summer was just a write-off basically (laughs) I I was experimenting more with cooking so it was like I'd not long become vegan um so it was quite exciting for me I was like trying all these new uh, different techniques and stuff but I think I was also like oh my god look at all of this processed meat that I can buy um and it tastes exactly the same but this last few weeks actually I've had to just have like a complete diet not diet change but really think about what I'm eating because it just I got to a point bread I think I'm gonna have to give up bread basically I know it's vegan but I think I'm gonna have to give it up my stomach at the moment so gross (laughs) (laughs) just can't hack it and yeah just like loads of processed stuff it was just making me so tired lethargic and so I've kind of switched more now to sort of you know whole food fruit and veg um, and just really think about it not necessarily from like a pandemic point of view but I think it's made me feel healthier, which made me make me fight the virus better. It's a weird one, isn't it? I think some people have gone, whoa, you know, I could catch this and I could die or yeah, of course. be hospitalized. I need to sort out my diet and my lifestyle and, you know, get a lot healthier. 
And I think other people, uh, myself included to a certain degree, kind of went, whoa, pandemic, homeschooling, mm. job. And I just, I did kind of lose my way a little bit. Um, yeah. I think last year I did put on some, you know, a few pounds, <laughs> quite a few pounds, okay. It's fine. Uh, and, um, you know, there was a lot more vegan pizza and stuff like that. And it was a kind of a case. So, and I was drinking more alcohol, you know, um, <laughs> it was a it was a case of sort of getting through it. Whereas now yeah. I think we're obviously we're still in the midst of it. But I think we are kind of, you know, anyone who ha- did sort of go down that road is kind of thinking right now it's time to kind of yeah. get back on the, the uh, healthy path again. Yeah, I think for like a mental health side of it as well, like you just feel so much more alert. You feel so much brighter when you do follow, you know, a healthier diet, which obviously is easier said than done for some people. And um, but for me, as soon as I started eating, you know, a bit more of a whole food diet, um, I feel a lot less clammy in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I feel a lot more energetic mm. and just, yeah, like sort of bouncing around actually the healthier, <laughs> the healthier I eat. Yeah. But yeah. It's not always possible. So let's just go easy on ourselves. Um, let's, let's talk about the action being taken against Subway over the last mm. week. Um, so, so in last week's episode, we discussed action being taken against McDonald's, which involved the muck sit-ins with <laughs> eating their little packed lunches. Love it. I still love it. <laughs> yeah. And um, obviously uh, wider activism with people, you know, uh, vegans shutting down the supply chains. So Good Catch were taking the action and against Subway. This followed news that uh, their tuna subs, I believe, had no yeah. tuna DNA. <laughs> I know that some articles have mentioned that when tuna is cooked, the DNA is kind of lost anyway, but mm. still. I just don't know what it would be otherwise. It's quite, it's not the nicest looking product, I'll be honest. Yeah, so I guess maybe it can it could contain a different type of fish, but, you yeah. know, we're, we're speculating here. But anyway, Good Catch was founded by Chad Sarno, and I spoke to him in season two episode seven if you want to go back and have a listen really passionate guy and obviously the brother of Derek Sarno and they run Wicked Kitchen which uh, is obviously in Tesco stores so yeah amazing brothers doing amazing things for the world and they have been touring London New York not them personally but (laughs) (laughs) which is a shame but um, some vans called Our Way they've been touring London New York Austin and Texas feeding people fish free subs and they've been kind of parked outside subway stores I think (laughs) yeah parked outside giving away for free by the way I wish I got one yeah I know amazing they look good I think their logo and stuff was a bit on the nose it was very similar and I think maybe that's what they wanted you know cause a direct attention um but yeah they've filed um well not filed it they've handed them a cease and desist haven't they with the threat of potential lawsuit against them which is quite interesting yeah well it's you know they're obviously hitting them where it hurts kind of the aim of activism isn't it but yeah I mean do you ever eat at Subway now you're vegan or do you Mm. used to um I used to before, but again, kind of, I've I had to take like a proper look at what I was eating and stuff because it wasn't very healthy. Obviously, Subway is not the healthiest thing. No matter how many salad stuff you can put in there, it's it's not very good for you, is it? But yes and no. I think I tried the vegan meatball one and I didn't like the cheese, but I don't like vegan cheese anyway. So, well, I'm not the biggest fan of vegan cheese, but it just wasn't for me. And I'm not really one for like meatball sandwiches and stuff. Yeah. So it wasn't the nicest. And I think I can just get equally as nice sandwiches at home. <laughs> yeah. Or like Marks and Spencer's or something. Mm. They do. Mm. Oh, have you tried their um, egg mayo? T- oh, no, I haven't. It's amazing. I nearly bought two. I had, oh. I ate it. So it's, yeah, it's, it's egg mayo, but obviously without egg, it's tofu instead. And I think like cannellini beans or something mm. and, and cress. I mean, I haven't had egg mayonnaise for years. Amazing. And, um, it's got the black salt in it. So it's got that kind of slightly eggy flavor, mm-hmm. but not too eggy. So yeah, I definitely recommend that one. 
Yeah, that's delicious. Have you tried the, um, is it the pastrami one? I can't. Hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's everyone's reaction. Oh my goodness. I know. I'm always so happy because the M&S, there's a little like food M&S about 10 minutes from me oh. and uh I make little sort of pilgrimages <laughs> down there to get my no salt beef you know pastrami oh. um roll and they've Heaven. always sold out they've always sold out so I'm like well this is great because it means everyone's buying them but at the same time it means I don't get to eat them so it's I'm kind hungry of a... <laughs> yeah. well let's get on to our reviews then and talk for all things vegan food so latest launch in Tesco's Mm -hmm. is from Over the Spoon which I believe used to be called Freaks of Nature yeah I think so they had a little brand change love that yeah yeah so I love Over the Spoon um and they've launched a range of products including lemon cheesecakes which are two pound for two like little pots yeah little pots some chocolate fudge puddings again two pound for two Belgian double chocolate mousses one pound 75 for two and the pièce de résistance. Oh, drum roll, please. Strawberry <laughs> trifles, which are one pound fifty each. Did you try all of them? <laughs> yes, I did. I think me and my boyfriend sat here on the sofa, and we were just eating them one after another. I don't know who we thought we were, giving each other like really in-depth reviews of like each one. Like, mm, yeah, the crumb on that is delicious. <laughs> just going at it, it was delicious, amazing. The cheesecake one was gorgeous. Um, the trifle oh wow yeah they were the two standout ones for me I really like the lemon cheesecake because they were kind of zingy mm. and yeah really nice gluten free the whole range is gluten free I believe as well as vegan great and a really nice lemon mousse the strawberry ty- trifle they were very sweet but I did really enjoy them the custard you know oh takes me back to like my yeah. childhood mm-hmm. um a little bit of gluten-free sponge and vanilla cream topping and obviously the strawberry uh sort of jelly compote the compote it? yeah that was my favorite because I thought it kind of like cut through the sweetness really nice what about the um d- Belgian double chocolate mousses oh yeah I love that too I love a mousse that's what reminds me of when I was younger I always used to have chocolate mousse on Sunday yeah um, <laughs> And I was just like tears in my eyes. No, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was delicious. And the um what is the other one? chocolate the chocolate, chocolate fudge. fudge pudding? Yeah, delicious. Heated that up so easy. Yeah, I'm so I'm not really a much of a pudding person. So okay. I did try the Belgian double chocolate mousse, which was nice. I have found it had a slight aftertaste, but it could just be me because I don't eat things like that very often yeah a brilliant range and that's in Tesco's now so go check that out the other thing we tried this month was the new launch from Higgity they launched two vegan quiches and some mini no pork pies in January which we reviewed on the podcast and I also love their porcini mushroom and spinach rolls which Mm -hmm. are like sort of vegan sausage rolls but now they've launched vegetable samosa vegan rolls which are 265 for six they are, they kind of contain spiced cauliflower, carrot, chickpeas with sweet mango chutney in a vegan puff pastry and like a sprinkling of seeds on top. I don't know about you, but when I heard they were called vegetable samosa vegan rolls, I was like, oh no, you're messing with the sausage roll. Yeah. Here. I when you know, like when you go out for a vegan, ro- you know, roast dinner at a pub or something and they're mm-hmm. serving like a spiced chickpea something or other (laughs) with the roast you're thinking look I love spiced chickpeas I love roast but they to me they don't go together I don't want to have like Indian flavors with a British roast dinner (laughs) maybe that's just me so I was like oh no you know I'm not sure about these but oh my god I couldn't stop eating them I had two packs in the space of an hour (laughs) but in my defense they're only small they're only small I was hungry tiny but they're so delicious oh my gosh it said to heat them up no I'm eating these now oh no I didn't heat them up I love no neither did I I was hoping you did so that (laughs) but I I love cold pasties too yeah pasties all the way cold Um, savory pastries yeah I was yeah I was kind of I don't know what I thought it was going to be like I sort of go down the sausage roll route but it was delicious it was like having a samosa gorgeous loved it 
and they had all the flavors in there as well yeah could you taste the like I think like black onion seeds yeah cardamom in there the fennel it was really like fresh I was do you know when sometimes you have like I don't know if you ever had like a samosa from Tesco or whatever and it doesn't quite it doesn't quite live up to the flavor but this one I really enjoyed it yeah and not too sweet either from the mango chutney I thought Mm. it might be a bit sickly but yeah they're available in Waitrose and Tesco's and um you know, I'd say go check them out. But like I said, they're addictive. So <laughs> it's up to you. Be careful at your own <laughs> risk. <laughs> yeah. oh, fantastic. So let's just finish off today with a reader question, which is about ice cream, which is very topical because <sighs> we are all sweltering. And, um, <laughs> definitely not complaining about it. Uh, but ice cream, yeah, great way to cool off. So what's your favourite vegan ice cream, Molly? Um... I know it's a tough one. It's tough it to is choose. a tough one. I think anything salted caramel. Co-op do a really nice one, which is like in the pot. Um, I had the Wicker Kitchen. Is it the mint chocolate one? That was really nice as well. Yeah. I tend, to, I tend to buy like pots rather than ice lollies. Tesco's own brand do. I can't remember what they're called, but that ice cream on a stick, and then they've got like a strawberry like ice coating on it. I okay. Don't know I Tesco don't know. own brand or yeah it... Tesco's like free from okay well I've looked for those I love ice cream so much Do you? <laughs> <laughs> luckily we've got a nutritionist on next so we will <laughs> balance out all our bad behavior with some health talk um, but yeah if I'm out and about I always go for the Swedish glass cones with they've got the Swedish glass ice cream and then like a layer of chocolate over the top they're amazing really Delicious. lovely sort of vanilla flavor Mm. I did also buy the Wicked Kitchen birthday cake ice cream the other day what did you think I I actually really liked it It oh did you yeah again really vanilla-y so I tried it and I think the first few mouthfuls are really nice and then it just it it's very sweet isn't it it's very sweet yeah yeah I, I don't I didn't actually eat that much of it maybe you sort of went a bit (laughs) <laughs> like I love ice tub. cream <laughs> <laughs> but yeah there's so many out there now um Jude's do some really good ones raw yeah. do some lovely ones which are oar I think we reviewed one a, f- a while back which had like macadamia nuts in I think mm. which was really good but you're talking premium price you know four or five yeah. quid which you don't always want to spend do you so um you know I think the, the for me a tub of Swedish glass vanilla ice cream in your freezer is a really good one to have to keep everyone happy definitely and you can add stuff to it as well fantastic well like I said we won't be here next week myself and Molly are taking a little holiday not together and not anywhere (laughs) I wish (laughs) yeah not not anywhere exotic either um I am off to Devon camping and I don't think the weather's going to stay around so I could get a bit soggy but never mind uh next I speak to Rohini Bajekal she is a nutritionist a lifestyle medicine professional and she also represents plant-based health professionals and we discuss the national food strategy and she shares her tips for anyone new to plant-based eating and also what she eats in a day which always fascinates me Hi Rohini, welcome to the Simply Vegan podcast today. How are you? I'm really well, thanks. It's boiling hot in London, um, but yeah, enjoying it. And uh, it's nice to get a bit of sunshine after such a rainy few months as well. It is. Yeah, I expect by the time some people are listening to this, it'll be raining again. So <laughs> need to make the most. It might be raining later today as well. I'm not sure. <laughs> Who knows? Tell. Well, let's just run through some of your credentials so that our listeners know, you know, a bit about you and why you're qualified to be talking to us today about plant based diets um, and the national food strategy. Um, You've got a first class master's degree in nutrition and food sciences, board certified lifestyle medicine professional. You're a plant based nutritionist and you also represent the plant based health professionals, don't you? I love chatting to you guys from the plant-based health professionals. I'm just such a fan of uh, Dr. Shireen Kassam, who who obviously runs it. I mean, we've had her on the show before. 
Um, so how did you end up going into this field of work? Because you originally studied theology at Oxford, didn't you? Yes, it's quite different to where I first started out. But actually, um, I've been vegan for a really long time. So I first, it really felt that my sister and my mum were, were really um, the only vegans that we knew I mean, we just knew each other because I first went vegan when I was about 13 and this was over this was almost 20 years ago so a really long time ago and it was a completely different world back then you'd get a chalky soya milk in a health food store you have to go and um, track there and my mum would have to bake and cook everything from scratch along with my dad and uh, when I went off to Oxford I was hopeful that I'd meet lots of other vegans and people who cared about the same things, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. And by the time I left university, I had sort of lost my way quite a bit and I started eating not animal, not um, uh, meat, but I started eating some animal products such as dairy and things outside of the house. And that was, you know, looking back, it was quite a challenging time in my personal life. And luckily in my mid twenties, I found my way again when I'd moved to India to work in the food industry. And I was sort of looking around, realizing that I was marketing and selling all these products that I thought about how healthy were they really. And that's when my interest in nutrition deepened because I had also gone back to a more plant-based diet, well, an entirely plant-based diet while I was living in India. And I felt incredibly well I felt really healthy and I felt really happy both mentally and physically and I started to reconnect with sort of my um, um the original reasons why I went vegan which was for animals of course and um I, I definitely described myself as an ethical vegan but I realized that all the the ways that I had, was still trying to eat a vegan diet at university weren't necessarily the healthiest so I was really relying on a lot of processed accidentally vegan foods such as chips um, a lot of falafel wraps, um, crisps, uh, chocolate, anything that I could get my hands on because all you would get in those days was maybe some potatoes on the side and a tangerine for dessert. So it wasn't a really balanced menu. You couldn't even really get tofu widely available and things like that. So it was definitely a struggle and I didn't know that much about nutrition then. And that's what really piqued my interest and I decided to apply to university and I did the plant-based nutrition course from, either, um, for, uh, from e Cornell and that you know it really changed my life I think going back into this I realized there's no other career for me I'm just so passionate about plant-based nutrition. Yeah I think uni is a, a time where a lot of us eat really badly isn't it you kind of leave home and you don't really know what you're doing in terms of cooking and you kind of bung things in the oven and I mean I wasn't vegan at uni unfortunately but I mean I was eating some yeah horribly processed foods that now I wouldn't you know dream of touching I think it's all part of learning isn't it and kind of growing up and and um, you know obviously as a vegan you were very limited Completely. I'm very honest about my journey because it's not perfectly linear. There's definitely been ups and downs, but I just want people to know that you don't need to have perfection. It's really about making progress and bringing in positive changes. And, you know, no one is there to beat you up if you get it wrong. You've just got to do what's what's um, what's right for you. And definitely health first is really, really important um, when you're looking after yourself. And obviously you can thrive on a plant based vegan diet or at any stage of your life. So um, yeah, that it's I, I completely agree. When I was growing up, I was eating really healthy, home-cooked, mostly Indian food. And I really lost my way at university because I just didn't have that available to me. And um, that I, I, that's why I spend my time now trying to help other people bring in the changes and um, make it sustainable for the rest of their lives. Yeah, it sounds like, like a fantastic job. Well, that leads us quite nicely into what we want to talk about today, which is the National Food Strategy. For those who don't know what this is, it's the first major review of England's food system for 75 years by the government. Part one was published last year and focused on obesity, poverty and the UK's high COVID death toll. Part two has looked at the climate crisis, biodiversity, pollution and uh, sustainable use of resources and of course the effect of meat production on the environment. So what conclusions can we take from this latest report? Well I think the report is really a step in the right direction. Uh, as someone who worked in public relations and public affairs for a long time I think it's great to see these recommendations being put for, forward 
um, in such a bold way, including plans to for the nation to reduce meat consumption by 30% by 2030, which is really quite astonishing. And I think it's really the right way forward. There are some things that obviously um, didn't really get included in the report, but overall I was pleased to see it and the focus on, on plant-based proteins, as well as the importance of eating a more plant-based diet to address the ongoing climate crisis. So I think overall, a lot of the plant-based health professionals are pleased to see the re these recommendations in the report. Of course, we would like it to be entirely plant-based and the shift to a plant-based food system, but I think it's a good good chance to kind of lay out this uh, this new new strategy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, 30% is, I, I suppose, a fair bit, isn't it? But yeah, perhaps it could have gone... A lot further in um you know what they they're recommending do you think this has grabbed enough of the headlines because i don't feel like it's had an awful lot of news coverage it hasn't had enough news coverage i think there's been a lot of you know stuff in more of the right-wing um media sort of saying that henry dimbleby who you know spearheaded the report is it shows a disdain for people who are living in poverty because taxing um, sugar and salt or sin taxes as they're sometimes called don't have the effect that we sometimes want. I think there was a, a soft drink or sugary tax that was put forward by when Theresa May was in government and then there was you know, a report showing that actually sugar had gone up in consumption but I think there are you know overall I think that that is a step in the right direction and I think that there's always going to be that concern from perhaps the more right-wing press that, that this is nanny state um, tactics but I don't I wouldn't agree with that personally and I think that prescribing fruits and vegetables does send the right message around the benefits of plant-based nutrition and, and certainly eating more whole plant foods whatever your eating um, pattern is as well as lifestyle medicine. Do you think we need to kind of do you think people will start to change their eating behaviors you know if they see these headlines or do you think we kind of need to tackle it on a higher level by you know sort of making people in the food industry take responsibility? I think that education is really important I like the fact that the report highlighted how children really need to be the focus because children are unfortunately they're the ones who are also going to inherit the damage and the destruction we've done to this planet but also they're the ones who have hope give us hope for the future and and also who can whose minds can be changed more easily and I think and um, that that was really promising and there were some things that were mentioned such as community kitchens I personally volunteer and teach for Maiden Hackney which is an eco-friendly plant-based community kitchen and um, based in Hackney in London and I think that it's a wonderful way to actually get people in touch with the ingredients, with food, because cooking is an essential skill and really a fundamental human skill that everyone should know. I think that you need the education, but you also need the food industry to be held accountable because unfortunately it's not enough. And I think until fruits and vegetables are subsidized instead of meat and dairy, we're not going to be able to actually say that nutritious, healthy, plant-based foods are accessible and available to everyone equally. That's just not the case, unfortunately. Even the current Eat Well guide from the NHS is out of reach for a lot of families to be able to meet um, through their daily diet. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's debate about whether a plant-based diet is expensive or not, isn't there? Personally, yeah. I find it can be extremely cheap because you can obviously cook, you know, you could cook an amazing curry with some rice, some um you know some pulses some lentils which are obviously you know you could get for maybe 50p in a tin and some perhaps some frozen veg um yes so completely i mean we know um in the 2021 veg facts report that came out and um, i think it showed that household income does impact vegetable consumption and the poorest households eat the least and um i think that so we know that unfortunately fruits and vegetables are still are still 
more expensive than they should be, especially because meat and dairy is so heavily subsidized, for example, um, milk in schools or in welfare packages and so on. We should be also offering um, fortified milk alternatives like soya milk and things like that. And that needs to be subsidized, not the other way around, including you know, promoting foods that are harmful for the planet as well as for human health. Um, so I, I think that it's very possible to eat a plant-based diet on a budget, but I wouldn't want to say that it's accessible to everyone because un unfortunately in the current food system that we're in, um, we've made it really difficult for people who are on a budget. And it's actually going to be more ultra processed foods that they're going to be relying on. So even when um, they've found the poorest households households are eating fruits and vegetables, they're coming in the form of ultra processed foods, um, which is not ideal. Yeah. What, what do you think the average person can do if they are vegan, plant-based, really passionate about, you know, the health of our nation, reducing our death rates from COVID, which I'll touch on in a minute with the Zoe COVID study. I don't know if you've seen um the results of that yes. which, yeah um you know obviously our, like you said the next generation and um you know and of course the animals and uh pandemics of the future that kind of could come out of factory farming what can we do to avoid just kind of sitting here feeling frustrated and, and fed up with the way things are well, that's a big question, really, when it comes to activism, isn't it? How can you as an individual make a difference? And I think it's important to remember that there's no one who's too small to make a difference. You should make your voice heard. And you don't need to be on the streets with a placard. Obviously, that's been harder in COVID times as well. But you can write to your MP. I write to my MP and let them know where you stand on some of these issues. Let them know um, what, what your thoughts are and what you would want to put forward. If you have the money, then donate to organisations such as plant-based community kitchens doing the work and um, grassroots organizations that you're passionate about perhaps get involved there are lots of different programs out there you could join an organization like plant-based health professionals uk where we have members who are plant-based health professionals but who are allies and who want to support the education that we're putting out there and you can you should use your own talent and skill set to the most so i think it can be frustrating sometimes when people say oh i'm not a nutritionist i'm not a doctor how can i go out there and put out the right message but no one, everyone, we need everyone in this fight. We need everyone to make a difference. So it could be simp as simple as um, volunteering at school events or uh, you know, spreading the word to friends and family. It could be anything as small as that, volunteering at, at um, charities or community kitchens. There's lots of different things that are on the ground um, in terms of community support to try and improve access to this. I think it's been heartbreaking to see in, during the pandemic just how bad it's been in terms of um, um, food, food parcels and things like that and the number of people that are relying on those. We just shouldn't be living in a situation like that in a country like the United Kingdom in 2021. No, definitely not. There's some really good points there. Thank you. I'll certainly be taking on board some of those. I, I was speaking to a friend about it earlier, actually, and just, you know, saying how kind of frustrated I get sometimes. And they reminded me how lucky I am to have this platform to speak to people and raise awareness. Um, obviously, not everyone's that lucky, but, you know, we can all talk to friends and family, although I think some of my family are getting a little bit fed up with me constantly banging on about going plant based. Um, but, you know, I think we, yeah, we, we can, we can, like you say, we need everyone on board and um, that's quite an empowering way of thinking about it. No, totally. And I think a podcast is a brilliant way to kind of magnify by your message and get it out there. Social media is another platform that can be used for good or bad. And I personally do try to raise awareness of these issues on my social media pages, particularly Instagram. And you don't know who you're gonna reach. Sometimes people reach out to you that you wouldn't expect. And even if you have 10 followers or 100 followers, you know, it really does help to put out this information. I think everyone yeah, has a talent that they can use and to raise awareness of the inequity and um, the injustice of our current food system. Yeah. So let's touch on the Zoe COVID study. So this is, has been run by Tim Spector over the last kind of year and a half, hasn't it? Um, I expect yeah. some of our listeners will have the app, which encourages you to report your health regularly. I know I've been sort of a bit obsessively <laughs> reporting my health over the last year and a half, just to kind of feel like I'm doing something and helping out. Um, so the results of the 
sort of the data from, from the app have concluded that those following a plant-based diet had a 10% reduction in risk of catching COVID and a 40% reduction in getting severe disease, which is amazing, isn't it? Um, yes, it is. I think it's really, I was really pleased to see that and it sort of confirmed what we, what we suspected as well. Again, hasn't grabbed the kind of main news headlines, has it? I mean, I know there's an awful lot going on in the world right now. We have flooding in, in parts of Europe and obviously COVID continuing to kind of rip through the world. But, you know, this, this is really important stuff. This, is, this could save lives. Completely. I, I think it's really frustrating that there's not more awareness of it, especially the fact that we know that the low quality diet and, and you know, ha having that, it was more pronounced in low income communities. So um, food is actually one of the factors that's contributing to the health disparities we've actually seen in the COVID-19 pandemic as well. Um, and I think, you know, they're not saying to everybody that you need to go vegan, although obviously if you are eating exclusively plant-based, a healthy plant-based diet, you, you may have an, an extra advantage, but we do need to be focusing the vast majority of our diet around these healthful whole plant foods like whole grains, beans, lentils, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds. And that's really where we need to be at. Unfortunately, the vast majority of our diet is actually ultra processed foods, which are things like um, breakfast cereals, crisps, cookies, um, you know, takeaways, these kinds of foods. And that's really not what we want to be at. Yeah. So anyone who is new to plant-based eating, what would your advice be for getting started? So that's really what I'm all about. I, I help people to transition. And I think that everyone has a different style in terms of the way that suits them. There are some people I work with who are ready to dive right in and they want to go plant-based overnight. Other people want to take their time and gradually bring in changes. Usually that's what I recommend in terms of allowing the gut microbiome to adapt to the increase in fibre. But of course, some people want to go plant-based overnight, particularly if they're doing it for ethical and environmental reasons. And they may have seen Slaughterhouse video or something that's really changed their mind. You know, the lights come on, they want to make that change immediately, which is also fine. And that it's a, it's a healthful way of doing it, of course, as well. Um, so what I really recommend is starting with one meal at a time. So breakfast is often one of the easiest meals to veganize in terms of switching to, if you have breakfast cereals, switching to a more whole unprocessed type of grain like porridge oats, maybe steel cut oats, and um, having some blueberries, some ground flaxseed, which is rich in omega-3 fatty acids, the alpha linoleic acid that's abundant in flax seeds and some nuts and seeds. And then having you know gradually bringing in more plants to your diet so if you're used to having chicken and uh, ch chicken in your dinner and your curry switching to tofu or switching to chickpeas and just making these simple swaps is a really good idea unfortunately because plant protein hasn't really been prioritized in the standard western diet it's very easy to take out the meat and the fish and not to bring in healthful plant foods but you really need to prioritize nutrient dense whole plant ingredients especially plant protein in your meals so I'm all about bringing that in and not just removing but focusing on what you can bring in because it really there is an abundance of food out there and I'm such a foodie and I definitely enjoy my food so much more since going plant-based and obviously I'm from an Indian background and we from South India where the food is actually naturally mostly dairy free and there is a huge amount of variety out there but there are there are thousands of ingredients I think there's something like 20,000 edible plant species and when you think about the fact that we eat the same six animals it's quite heartbreaking really because there is a lot of delicious food and flavor to be explored. I'm exactly the same I was never a foodie and as soon as I discovered this whole new world I I mean I'm actually getting to a stage where I'm eating too much <laughs> I get I get a bit addicted to things like you know raw slaw with just a little bit of vinaigrette or something on it it's just so mm -hmm. tasty <laughs> I know um, I think I think so Holly I would really emphasize that as well to people that you know sometimes food that you previously didn't like actually doesn't taste very exciting because you're used to 
the extreme sweetness or sugariness or oiliness of ultra processed foods, which food manufacturers play on. I mean, I've worked in the food industry myself and I know how taste buds are exploited to food manufacturers benefit. And it can never compete with the natural sweetness of a carrot or the crunch of an apple. But once you remove those foods from your diet, at least initially completely, you can really start to recalibrate and adjust to the deliciousness of whole plant foods. And now I'm not some sort of, you know, saint in terms of the food I eat. I don't think there is moral value to, to this type of food in terms of, um, you know, you haven't broke, broken up with a whole food plant-based diet if you have a vegan cookie. And I definitely like to have treats and things now and then, but I try to focus the the vast majority of my meals around whole plant foods because that's what gives me energy. It's it's obviously even better for the planet because you're using often less packaging and so on. And, and it's it's often cheaper because some of the, the tastiest and healthiest foods in the supermarket do tend to be things like beans, lentils, oats, potatoes, all of which are really cheap and affordable for most people. Obviously, we still have a way to go in terms of making nutritious plant-based foods available and accessible to everyone. But I think, um, yeah, that's the way I personally choose to eat. And I certainly enjoy vegan treats now and then as well. It's always so good when I chat to a nutritionist on this show to hear that they do have treats because we kind of imagine nutritionists with like a halo around their head and they never slip up and we can't possibly ever, you know, be as healthy as you guys. But, you know, like you say, it's all about kind of, you know, in moderation, isn't it? And as long as your diet is consisting mainly of all these health giving foods, then, you know, a bit of vegan chocolate or something isn't going to you know, it's uh, it's not the end of the world. And I think that it, it is important to emphasize just because there has been such a proliferation of um, sort of ultra processed vegan foods compared to when I was younger, where I, I would have probably um, lost it if I'd gone to the supermarket and seen what's on <laughs> 13 year old I remember the first veg fest I ever went to where there was a vegan cupcake and my sister and I were fighting over it for the rest <laughs> of the day <laughs> because it was the last one that was available but Aww. you know it's, um, it, the world has changed now and I would tell anyone who's vegan who's listening to this to you, you can completely be um, vegan for the animals and everything but you do need to hopefully look after your health if you can because um, it, it will allow you to hopefully stay on this path ever without having the same health issues or as many as um you know people eating a diet that's rich in ultra processed foods and animal foods and you know health is not a moral obligation but in just in terms of looking after yourself it's a really great thing to do to just base more of your meals around whole plant foods just to safeguard your health because vegans do get sick as well and we're not immune it's not a panacea for illness in terms of it's not going to be 100 percent protective against everything including COVID-19 although clearly a healthy plant-based diet does reduce your risk and we should be shouting it from the rooftops really but um I think we need to do all the other things to look after ourselves as well definitely so let us in on your kind of dietary secrets then what does your day look like in terms of what you eat and your nutrition so I really there isn't really a standard one day for me in terms of I do have quite a lot of variety food is one of my passions in life and I really really enjoy cooking because it's quite meditative for me and I use it to switch off I often listen to a podcast like Simply Vegan <laughs> it just helps me unwind and kind of gets me into a different state for the evening which I really enjoy but um, I, I try to bring in as much variety as possible simply because we know that having a lot of variety of plant-based foods in your diet actually helps with your gut microbiome and the American Gut Project found that eating at least 30 different plant foods a week can help so that means if you always go for red peppers try green peppers or yellow peppers if you always go for nectarines try peaches or pears or apples so just change it up but I always start the day with with breakfast and um, it's something that is, is quite important to me. And I generally wake up with a good appetite. So I have a bowl of something like steel cut oats or amaranth or buckwheat. I love all these naturally gluten-free pseudo grains because they're particularly high in iron, zinc, calcium, and so on. And they're, they're really underrated, but my dissertation was about amaranth because it is just such a fantastic grain that's incredibly 
um, drought resistant as well. So really, really great and higher in calcium even than quinoa and things like that. So I usually have like a sprouted grain bowl in the morning or if I'm in a bit of a rush then just some sewer cut oats. But I always have it with fortified soy milk, with lots of blueberries, some ground flaxseed, which is really great in terms of getting your um, some of your omega threes for the day. And uh, I, I also top it with some other seeds or fresh fruit or whatever I can find, maybe some cacao nibs, which are rich in magnesium. Really, I try to mix it up in terms of the toppings that are there. In the winter, I might have a fruit compote that I've made myself. And then for lunch, I tend to have a massive salad and I always add in legumes. So I try to have two to three servings at least a day of lentils or beans. So I would add in chickpeas or cannellini beans or maybe some homemade hummus and have a big salad. And I always add things like avocado or a source of healthy fats as well. And then my dinner is usually some kind of Indian food or I love Vietnamese, I love Thai, I love Ethiopian food. I love experimenting with different things. Um, but it could be something like dal with red rice and um, a, another salad as well as some cooked vegetables. Or it could be, I've got lots of recipes on my website as well, like red lentil bolognese and things like that. So yeah, I tend to have meals like that. And I tend to, if I'm going to snack, I have um, crudités or I have fresh fruit. I love fruit as well. Um, and drink lots and lots of water. So that's really my go-to. I don't find caffeine agrees with me that well. Um, I tend to get quite stressed out and anxious. So um, it, it tends to wind me up a little bit too much. So I stick to water, sparkling or still water. Yeah, I've actually given up caffeine recently. Well, the majority of caffeine, I have the odd coffee, but um, yeah, I do feel a lot better. I think it just sort of balances out your energy levels, doesn't it? Um, I think caffeine in itself isn't, you know, bad. And there are clear health benefits in drinking tea and coffee. And I've now switched to more decaf personally, but I think it's a problem if you're having four or five cups a day and not getting, and, and, and often that's been used to mask sleep or other issues. So um, I would just say to people who are consuming a lot, just to look at the rest of your, your lifestyle. And that's why lifestyle medicine is so important to me because diet is one cornerstone of health, but it's important to look at the other pillars as well if you really want to thrive um, eating this way. So um, just to confirm what your website is for anyone who wants to go and have a look at some of your recipes. Well, I'm working on a project which will make all my recipes much more available to everyone, which um, I can't fully disclose yet, but it's very exciting. Oh, fantastic. And, uh, I have a lot of recipes on my Instagram and on my website, rahimibajakal.com. And um, I have lots of other blogs on different topics, such as you know things like how to improve iron levels when you're eating a plant-based diet or top tips for getting more calcium. These are just sort of simple things and tips that I like to give people to make it really accessible, just practical takeaways that you can add into your everyday life. Like you might not realize that just adding a squeeze of lemon onto your dal, your lentil dal can actually aid the absorption of iron from it. So there are little tips and tricks that can make it really easy to eat this way and thrive. Wow, that's a brilliant tip. Okay, I'll try that. Well, Rohini, you've been amazing. Thank you so much for chatting to me today. Um, you know, as always, I could sort of chat all afternoon, but I'm sure you've got other things to be doing. Um, and we obviously have to keep it short for the podcast. So um, yeah, thank you so much. It's, uh, you've given us a real insight into the national food strategy and obviously, you know, covering the Zoe COVID study as well. So thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Holly. I'm such a big fan of the podcast and I really appreciate you having me on. I think um, everyone who is listening, do check out the Plant-Based Health Professionals UK website. So that's plantbasedhealthprofessionals.com. We have so many free fact sheets that you can go and take to your doctor or if you're a healthcare professional, you can have a look at the fact sheets. We have videos, webinars, events, a 21-day plant-based challenge. So just share them. They're all brilliant resources and um, we would love for you to join us as well if you're interested as well. Well, that brings us to the end of series three. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned lots. I know I certainly have. Um, we are taking a small break. We'll be back on the 3rd of August. We've got loads of exciting guests lined up for series four, talking about everything from vegan leathers to nutrition and much more. In the meantime, you can find lots of recipes and news stories and articles on the Vegan Food and Living website or social media. 
at Vegan Food and Living and at Simply Vegan Podcast. And please do head over to the reviews section of your platform of choice on iTunes or whatever you're listening on and leave us a quick review. Uh, This helps other people to know whether they'd like to listen and hopefully we can spread the word that veganism is the way forward. See you on the 3rd of August.